Welcome to Churches Canceled. I'm your host, Brett, co-host, Brett, and I am joined today by, it looks like Danny, actually. No Zordon or... Uh, no, I changed that. Maybe it didn't update on your side. It says Marty Magdalene. It'll become, <laughs> it'll become relevant later in the episode. Marty Magdalene. Yeah, not, not showing up on this side, but happy to identify you however you want to be identified. Thank you. You're you're welcome. Uh, today uh, on the show, we're introducing a new segment, Danny. That's right. And uh, the the new segment is called Church Cliche of the Week, where every week we, we we discuss a, uh, a a certain cliche that you're bound to hear in your church. That's right. Tell uh, me about this it. Which one? this this week, the Lord has been uh, really really putting this one on my heart. Uh, he's, he's put it on my heart to let you know that one of the worst church cliches is to say that God has put something on your heart. Uh, anyone, anytime someone says that, I want to rip their heart out uh, and stomp on it. Uh, and I'll tell you this, in my experience, it has been, if I had to put a statistic on it, it's two out of ten. Two out of ten times when somebody says that to me, I go, oh, that's authentic, and they're being serious, and God yeah. actually play something on their heart. Eight out of ten times, it's somebody pushing their agenda, and they're trying to shove Jesus. They're trying to shove their agenda up Jesus so that they can use the authority of Jesus to tell you to stop having fun. I'll give you an example of this. We, I was out with a bunch of people for dinner. So you know, I I have six or seven different Applebee's programs. after church after youth group on a Wednesday. Oh, <laughs> Another no, no. church cliche. Yeah, I know. It was not an Applebee's. Oh. It was I forget where it was. Um, it was a nicer place. You know, we were all in our mid twenties, getting to thirty, so we had money. Yeah, and I forget where we went. It was a a youth pastor. You know, you're gonna know who I'm talking about in a second. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know me, I'm just being me. And this youth pastor uh, texts me. Well, what he doesn't know is I have six different phone numbers, and I don't whatever phone number he has, I don't carry it with me. Sure. So he's expecting me to look at my phone, and he's like, "Oh, did you change your number? What happened?" I was like, "No, I don't know." And then he shows me the text message. Says, "Be like Jesus," because he was there with his like a couple of his youth acolytes or what have you. Uh huh. <laughs> and so I proceeded to flip the table over at this restaurant. <laughs> Kidding! I didn't do that, but I should. have. Chased everyone out of there with a whip, huh? That's right. Uh, That's the only way to do it. Yeah, but it was, it was, it was the polite way of saying, um, "I want you to soften it up." Yeah. I want you to, like, you know, um, if you could, just pretend like your nether regions are just smooth down there, like you're a Ken doll. Just you know? nothing there at all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was. I was at a, a marriage group. A couple weeks ago, and the because you're married, some, I keep forgetting. Yeah, somebody had God had been putting something on their heart. She wasn't even there, like the lady who usually facilitates the group. Mm. And her husband was like, "God's been putting this on my wife's heart to have you all listen to this song." And it was some worship song about being quiet. I swear to you, that was the worst worship song I have ever heard. <laughs> It may have been on her heart, but it was causing pain to my ears. This person could not sing to save their soul. Oh, uh, yeah. And you don't have to sing to save your soul. You just have to accept yeah. Jesus into your heart. That's it. And some people just don't need to sing. But, yeah, so today we have a good, we have a good one. Um, this scandal um, inspired, in many ways, yeah. this whole thing. The whole reason Churches Canceled exists, or at least this part of Churches Canceled exists. This is your favorite scandal, right? Oh, stop. It's the best yeah. one. And, yeah, you um, mentioned, it was fitting earlier, you mentioned people try to shove stuff up Jesus <laughs> to make it like Jesus. And right, we're going right. to be talking about a guy who may have been shoving some stuff up some places, and that uh, kind of yeah. caused this scandal. Let me clarify my earlier statements, because I'm already imagining the email or the WhatsApp messages <laughs> I'm going to get from family. Um, 
no one in my family realizes that like I logged into WhatsApp once, so it looks like I have it, but I don't. I don't. So they just message me, and that's, I'm not seeing it. Yeah, before. that's smart. Um, when I said they try to shove, they they're trying to um, work Jesus like a puppet. So they have an agenda, and they're trying to say, well, this is. They're trying to um, make their agenda Jesus's agenda because they they're authoritarian fascists, and they don't want anybody to have any fun wow. or laugh. And I, yeah, I said it. And that the particular person's a lovely guy. He's a great minister and all this other stuff, but does not know how to deal with people that um, love Jesus, but at the same time are not, um, they're free, because I'm free, I'm a free man, I don't, I got no strings on me, I'm not, you know, but a lot of my That's friends, what you think. Well, yeah, I mean, it is in many ways, but, you know, anyways, but Ted Haggard, <laughs> this is a fun one. Ted Haggard! Yep. Speaking of shoving stuff up, guys, <laughs> we're talking about Ted Haggard. That's right. The infamous Ted Haggard church so, scandal. This one hit me uh, different. This one hit different than the Driscoll for okay. me. Yeah, I'll say this much about Haggard and um, in, in comparison to Driscoll. The thing that's different about him was I kind of believe him. Like when he preaches, when he's talking, there's something mm-hmm. about him that I go, okay, maybe there's there's aspects of it which I go, okay, you're just saying that because that's what you're supposed to say. But there's aspects of it, which I go, oh, this guy's this guy's legit. He believes what he's saying. Um, and one of the funny things I, I you know I watch there's um, Alexandra or Alexandria. I don't know how to say her name. Alexandra Pelosi. Yeah, Alexandra Pelosi, the daughter of Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, um, made two documentaries featuring this guy, featuring Ted Haggard. I just watched one of them today. Which one? The the short one is like forty eight minutes long. The trials of Ted Haggard. Okay, yeah, that's more. That's probably the better one because that that happens after the scandal breaks out. Yeah. Um. And uh, what was interesting about both of those docs was, first of all, the era in which they're shot is is very. It's just like I would say the height of evangelical Christianity in America. I don't know if you would agree with that sentiment. I think it was the height. I think we're on a downturn now. I think our it was around 2006, 2007 when those were right. filmed. It was just interesting. The the one thing I found fascinating, just aside from the Ted Haggard stuff, was like how his church in particular was like we're on a global mission and we're praying for the whole globe. Yeah. To see that in contrast, 15 years later. Where it's like if he's and he, here's the best part, he rode a scooter to save gas into his church, and this is so Ted Haggard at one point in time was the head of the National Association of Evangelicals, which they say represents dog. thirty million Americans. Yeah, um, he had a huge church in Colorado Springs, Colorado called New Life Church. Hey, new Life caveat: Stop with the new lives. No more cornerstones. Okay. I can't, I don't have... I don't want to go to a church by a river. Anything with river in the name is out for me. Anything with a valley in the name is out for me. We're done with that. I I think you. that's just your personal trauma. We're, but I can't, I just, sometimes I look at these names of churches and I just go, is this a golf course? Is this a <laughs> retirement community? Is this, an, is this a, is this a, apartment complex that is just normal but they call it a luxury apartment complex it's just a mid-tier like you know c class what we call in real estate b or c class real estate yeah um, but they just we're the top this is a luxury living homes or whatever so that's why in minnesota i went to a church called substance church because i couldn't deal with the branding of all the other places which by the way at Substance, uh, this is a caveat from the whole episode. I meant to say this at the beginning. I met a guy named Tommy Rabine or Thomas Rabine, and he reached out to us and made this bumper music. Come on, yes. the Lord provided. Thank you, Tommy. So, thank you. We appreciate that. If you notice in this episode, it has music now. Um, that's all Tommy. He just hit me up one day and said, hey, I'm going to make you guys bumper music. And then like six hours later, it's in, and it's in our email. Um, and if you want to email us, you can do that at blessings at churchescancel.com. 
Peace be upon you, or peace be with you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So you gave us a little bit of the background on Ted Haggard. Yeah. And I mean, what his did they church say in Colorado I Springs? I think it had ten thousand people. I think they said seventy five hundred people would come out on the weekends to his service, like to a, to a service at his church. And he was one of those preachers. He was one of those pastors who tended to have, I'm not going to use the word anti-gay because I think that's an unfair characterization, right. but traditional views on men and women and homosexuality. And uh, spoiler alert, I guess we'll just, you know, his, the accusation and which he kind of agreed with was yep. that he didn't deny anyway was um he uh he liked to do butt stuff with uh, with male mary magdalens and um the problem mary magdalens that, yeah so that's a that's a rough one it's a so the go the, back go back to his, let's go back a second his yeah, stance yeah. he I, I don't know that he had a strong stance against homosexuality, but as a leader of the National Association of Evangelicals, yes, their stance has always been more or less the same, is that to them it appears obvious that the Bible condemns homosexuality. I don't know that they specify what is homosexuality too much, because later, you know, Ted will say, well, I'm, maybe I'm more of a bisexual, or maybe I struggle with some same-sex attraction, which would, I think, technically be different than homosexuality. They don't oh, specify, but he, hold as on. a leader of the NAE, the evangelical yeah. church at large, would condemn that sort of behavior. And he, and he did have sermons where he would express that it should be a man and a woman. He was in uh, support of the amendment to the state of Colorado's constitution that marriage should only be between a man and a woman. He was, uh, you know, in, in a position of influence to get people to vote that direction against same-sex marriage. So you can see the hypocrisy we're being set up for here. Right. Now let me ask you a question. What do you think the delineation between being gay and same-sex attraction, like, as you said. Yeah, same-sex. Was there a difference between same-sex attraction? Obviously, there is between bisexuality. Shouldn't have to explain that one. But homosexuality and, and same-sex attraction. Um, I went to a Bible college. I had a professor. She was an English professor, actually, describe it <clears throat> this way. This is her opinion, which I tend to. Is, I don't know that I agree with now. I, I won't even get into my stance on it now. But um, no, get into your stance. On it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that this is a pretty thin story. It's pretty open and shut. So get into your stance on it, because otherwise this is going to be 15 minutes. We're in and out. So my professor says, actual the actual sin of homosexuality is in the yeah. the way the Bible defines it: a man mm -hmm. having sexual contact with another man. Okay. Not a man being attracted to another man. And I don't know if it specifies women or not, but you could easily yeah, take this, you know, conclusion. having sexual encounter or having sexual intercourse is, right. is what she said with someone of the same sex. So just because you are a, a guy who's a, an evangelical Christian who's attracted to other men, if you're not touching the peepees, you're not committing the sin of the homosexualities. So, okay. Let, let me just draw out this. Oh, it was defined for me in college. Okay, so I'm just asking. I had a fruitful experience, <laughs> and at my university, I gave them thousands of dollars to help me define this. Well, let's just hope this thing pays off. I mean, we have another <laughs> sponsor today, so at least this will it'll be a word something. So, based on that definition. I think it's safe to say two dudes can make out, no problem. No, that's making out is a sexual contact. Is it? You'll even find you'll even find examples uh, in the Bible. Oh my gosh, I'm I'm I mean, I'm not going to remember their names. It's fine. Uh, was it was it Dave? What was David's? Uh, what was the name of his armor bearer? Yeah, I know. Armor bearer is an interesting one because if you look at secular history and how they 
how they really define armor bearer. It's a little ha ha. Yeah. He had an interesting relationship with his armor bearer where it didn't seem outright homosexual, but certainly a little bit homoerotic. Okay. Uh, where there was maybe some male on male non sexual touching and affection. Okay. So Well, I mean, we've touched each other in a in a non sexual affectionate way. Oh, we've touched each other sexually for sure. <laughs> Stop saying <secret. laughs> You're at least married to a obviously beautiful woman. I'm yeah. I'm I'm the last man standing of my whole group of friends. So I keep you know what's going on over there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm five foot seven. Like the only, the only. I mean, this is going to come up in a later episode. But the only single girls at church that are interested have minimum two kids and minimum two hundred sixty thousand dollars in student loan debt. <laughs> and they listen. They're driving to the. They're driving to that hoop hard. So. <clears throat> so no. me personally, me personally, I don't think. Like I think if you're a pastor, yeah. and you say uh, you can't be a homosexual. Yeah. Okay. But then you kind of think you're a dude, and you kind of think dudes are hot, or you're a chick, and you kind of think chicks are hot, and you're a pastor, and you're saying those things. Well, I mean, okay, chicks can't be pastors. That's already out, <laughs> so that's not even a problem. Fine. Just yeah. maybe you shouldn't be uh, doing the touchy feelies. That's that's just me. That's just me. I'm trying to hold people to their own standard of what yeah. they say is right or wrong. What my moral standard is, is is irrelevant in the story of Ted Haggard and what we're talking about here. Yeah, and I would also go on a limb to say if you're if you if you're anti divorce and you say our church, you know, the word of God, God is aggrieved by divorce, all that jazz, don't get divorced and then get remarried. Like I, I there's countless stories which I ended up pulling from our call sheet because it was just like, well, he got divorced, remarried, and then went to rehab for like drugs and alcohol so it's like oh, there's not a, really a scandal here this one was a good one and my the part that really aggrieved me the most was you know ted haggard's this you know it's it's hard for us 20 nearly 20 years later 15 years later to really put ourselves in the historic era that he that ted haggard was so influential in the the uh, the documentary Friends of God, he had um, weekly calls with the White House. Influential, that's what I'm saying. Absolutely. Um, weekly calls with the White House. Now um, we already did our politics episode, and I think in there I mentioned, you know, if there's one thing is that youth say that gives me the ick. <laughs> look at me being relevant. <laughs> um, if there's one thing I find gross, it's when my church merges with 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 politics i am grossed up by it it makes me feel disgusting um and to see that and then dude they have like american flags up at their church it's like whoa mm-hmm. whoa let's take a let's, up, let's uh, is, slow the roll on that one but it was post 9 11 you know yeah. people's feelings towards things they were at it the was, time. Yeah. yeah and you know like for us thinking well 2006 that's really you know that had been a long time well, I was a teenager, so like, you know, four years flew by like a second. Now that I'm a little older, I go, I mean, four years would fly by really slow when I was a teenager. But as an adult, four years, like, I mean, like, it, it's gone in a minute. So, like, it, it's it's hard to put yourself in that situation or in that in that moment and to realize, like, like he was a really – and here's the problem with that, too, is – He's such a dope. He this dude is softer than wet cheese. Like he's such a nerd. And there's just something about him that you go, This is our guy. Yeah. Like he's a floppy like he just I don't know how else to describe Goofy, him. Goofy, grinning. Yeah. He reminds yeah. me in many ways of someone else that we know. <laughs> oh no. But um A lot of there's a there's a lot of that. I mean yeah, so the scandal. So the scandal. The scandal. Tell us about the scandal, Danny. So Your favorite one. Yeah. Tell the story. It's 2006. Tell us. Yeah, a male prostitute, male harlot by the name of uh, Mike Who? Jones. Who? Mike Jones. That's right. Back then they didn't want me. Now I'm hot. They all know on me. That's right. You thought you thought you were gonna catch me lacking? Come on. We lived in Texas together for like three or four years, man. Um, I'm always tipping, baby. 
Uh, Paul Foles, yeah. got 80 Foles, they're always poking out. But um, Not the same Mike Jones. <laughs> no, not the rapper from Houston, Texas, but a male prostitute named Mike Jones. And this is one of those, another example of, hey, you know the Bible well enough, and the Bible teaches us one thing, um, or many things, but one of them is, what you do in the dark will come to the light. Yeah. And what happened to Ted Haggard was he was campaigning or talking about not supporting gay marriage. Right. <laughs> and so the gay prostitute he would frequent with, with methamphetamine, by the way, Yes. was like, hey, maybe you don't get to say that stuff if I'm giving you special massages. Now, I don't know the you know more specific details of who is who is where who's massage and who yeah or who I saw Mike Jones I let that guy give me a massage man he looked um, like a strong guy he could get in or nice and deep like you know what I mean yeah so I'm not talking <laughs> euphemistically I'm talking straight up like he can give me a massage but if if we start playing hide the eggplant we I mean no thanks <laughs> I mean I'm I'm I like the ladies but I'm just saying like not really you know anyhow he, so Mike Jones outs Ted Haggard. Right. He says, here's a guy who's been speaking against gay marriage, and I'm over here giving him the pat down. Right. And as they say in the urban community, he's on the down low. The DL. That's right. Um, <clears throat> so he gets outed by Mike Jones. Who? Mike Jones. Um, <laughs> who, by the yeah. way... By the way, I think the real the real asshole in this story is Mike Jones. Why is that? So it's it's fine to out the guy, right? You're exposing his hypocrisy. I think that's fine. But he went he went on to kind of like play the victim and say, "Oh, it's people like Ted Haggard who have victimized me and they've condemned gay marriage and put down the gay community and they've hurt me and caused pain." while he's out there getting book deals and going on TV and radio. It's like, come on, bro. You're just playing this up right now. You're just trying to trying to milk the income out of this thing. Well, I don't, I mean, that is a, that's a dick move. I'm not going to lie. But at the same time, can you blame him? Like, he no, got no, his 15 minutes. Not. I mean, he he's, a, he's a true queen. He was always looking for his 15 minutes, aren't they all? <laughs> yeah. I mean... Isn't that the goal of being that fabulous is to, like, get your 15 minutes in the in the sun? I suppose it is. Yeah, so so Ted Haggard, you know, his church says, hey, you're going to go through a period of restoration. You have to leave. So the, the, this is the part where I go, mm, I don't know if I care for how that was handled. Um, yeah, they, not, ban- they banished him. They excommunicated him. As from a, the state. As- from this, yeah, that was the crazy part. Not even the church. They said you have to leave the state of Colorado, and I thought to myself, why the hell would anyone do this? If anyone said told me to leave the state, I'd be like, piss off. What are you going to do? Are you going to come to my house with guns? You're going to threaten me? But they, right. what they did is they made it a part of his severance package. So he still made the year after he left. They gave him a, a one year severance. He made like a over you know, hundred hundred thirty thousand dollars in that year. Right, uh, but okay. they weren't going to pay him if he didn't leave the state. So he left right. his house in Colorado. He still owned a home there, and then he, and, he still got paid for a year while he went off and did whatever in Arizona or wherever he was. Yeah, and the weird part about that to me was, like, it was the worst time. It was one of the worst times in American history to try and sell a house. Oh, like, yeah. And he probably didn't have a small house either. My presumption is he had a nice home. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, he goes and does the whole, you know, he goes on Oprah and he's with his wife and they're holding hands. I'm looking at the wife and I'm going, get while you're into dudes. Um, <laughs> I mean, she just has beard written all over her. You know what I'm saying? She just looks like this is the kind of lady that you pick when you're like, all right, I guess I got to. What does a beard out. look like? <laughs> what are you talking about? You can just you identify know, a beard by looks. She has the, I don't know what to tell you. She has, but she also looks like, also simultaneously looks like a lady, like a full Karen. Like she's like, there are children biking in the neighborhood. I have to call the police. 
Um, nah, dude, his wife was the best person in the whole story because the leaders of the church excommunicated him, made him leave the state. His wife, who had every right to divorce him, say all these bad things about him, didn't. She stayed by his side. You can question that choice however you want to. But she said, no, like Jesus calls us to forgive people and love them. And that's what I'm going to do for my husband. Uh, So beard or not, she was the one who stuck by him and supported him while, you know, the other people didn't. They made him get out. Uh, He was asking for money. And that then that became a thing. People like, what the hell do you need money for? Uh, You know, people wouldn't support him. But she did. Yeah, so I'm going to just um, disagree with you here and say that this whole thing is her fault. Because if she had just touched... <laughs> oh, no, no, go, ahead. Had just touched, go ahead. Go ahead, you're, gonna, you're, just, gonna, you're about to enrage the two female listeners we have, where they're gone. One of, one of them is your wife. She doesn't even speak English, so that doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so uh, so it's dad, Ted's wife's fault. Why? She wouldn't tickle him in his junk. That's all. Is that it? Yeah. He just wanted his pickle tickled. (laughs) That's right. Listen, if this story was a female prostitute and cocaine, I would have a lot more forgiveness in my heart because I go, guy just likes to party. Okay. Female prostitute and meth. The meth is the part where I'm like, buddy. But you understand why it's meth, right? No, listen, you're the pastor of one of the, at the time, one of the largest churches in the country. You can afford designer drugs. Why are you doing bathtub meth made by a guy who almost blew up a tractor trailer? He's trying to make <laughs> No, no, it's, so it's meth. Meth is super popular, especially at this time in the gay community. Meth gets you up, right? You can stay up for days at a time. I have talked to other older gay men about this. Don't ask me why. Uh, I don't want to. That wasn't about why this occurs, about why meth is popular, or at least more so in that time. I don't know what's going on now, Uh, but it's popular because you can stay up for a long time and you can fuck a lot. So what you do, (laughs) that's exactly why. So you take a little, you take a little meth. Okay. You got your, your boy toy, Mike Jones. You guys can stay up for days at a time, just fucking. So yeah. that's that's why I, it was in, that's specifically why it was meth. The meth okay. part made sense to me. It was at least to my concerns. He was just doing okay. the meth to have a little extra fun with Mike. No, so first of all, I don't know who's porking who in this scenario. Don't want to know either. But I get the impression that Mike's porking him. I'm just saying. Um, there's something about riding a scooter that just says, "I'm bottoming," <clears throat> but but power bottom because you know he's a leader. He's a leader of a big church, so, you know, um, so, like, and I've always said this, you know, I've never done a drug in my entire life because I have asthma, and I'm really afraid of what's going to happen if I do a drug and then have a negative reaction to it, but if I'm doing a drug, I'm doing that Colombian, I'm going on a Colombian ski vacation, baby. Yeah. I I'm not it? doing this nonsense. I'm just saying, like, it's, it comes out of the ground. God made it for our use. I mean. Yeah, that's what yeah, they no, say, it's, huh? It's not. But, um, but yeah, so he gets caught. He does the whole, you know, uh, apology tour. You know, I'm not about Restoration. Yeah. He did, he did three weeks of counseling with the church buddies. And then they came back and said, Ted Haggard is completely heterosexual. Three weeks is all it took to pray the gay out of this dude. <laughs> hookers and meth and that's all it took was three weeks come on there's that video clip if i was a better video editor because i edit all these videos i'd be clipping in right now of the of an african-american individual a black guy saying i'm not gay no more <laughs> i was like buddy buddy i don't think that's how this works that, but that was oh. apparently one of his his buddies who did the restoration counseling with him one of the other church leaders said he's completely heterosexual when he's interviewed by um, Alexandra Pelosi in the documentary, she says, why did you say you were completely heterosexual? He says, I didn't say that. Other dudes said that. <laughs> so I, I respect Ted Haggard a lot in how he dealt with his downfall. And I can yes. definitely see 
the type of duality in the internal struggle he must have had. Uh, he was super honest. I mean, at least when Alexandra uh, was interviewing him, she's, she's like, so what happened? He's like, I had an inappropriate sexual relationship with a man. Uh, and then he said that. He said, no, nah, he, he said, I didn't say I was completely heterosexual. Now later he said, maybe I'm bi or, you know, yeah. he, he kind of, he, he was honest about it. He didn't over spiritualize things. And I compare him to Mark right. Driscoll when Mark was getting pushed out of his church. He had that whole story about, Oh, I was in one room and God spoke to me and God spoke to my wife and God told me you're released from Mars Hill. And Ted yeah, Haggard yeah, yeah. didn't do any of that shit. Ted Haggard was like, damn, man, I kind of messed around with the dude. I did a little meth. Uh, you know, you can't do that in my profession. So here I am selling life insurance. Uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I respected yeah. how honest he was about what happened. He didn't over-spiritualize. Right. He didn't blame it on the the enemy. He said, right. I, made, I made this choice. I sinned. I did the wrong thing. And the Bible says it's wrong. I can't help that I have these urges. I still think it's wrong. Uh, he was just very honest right. about it. I got to respect that. And there's something about that um, when we compare. So when non-Christians talk about Christianity and why there's problems with it, the number one thing I hear isn't doctrinal, right? It's never like, oh, this theology is weird or that's wrong. It's always hypocritical. It's always we're hypocrites, right? My favorite one is like one of my non-Christian friends who don't understand I don't care. Like, you, okay, you don't believe? Fine. God bless. Go like it you're the one burning, not me. Like I'm off to the, you know, I'm off uh, I'm off in paradise. You do whatever you want. But they always hit me with the what about the Catholic Church? Like yeah, that's why we have an expansion team. That's why we left. Like yeah. that's why the Protestants existed, but <clears throat> to see someone uh, like so the weird thing is if you watch the Friends of God um doc and then you watch the he does say some stuff in there, and the funny part is the Friends, the Friends of God doc finishes, and a month later he gets busted. So Alexandra Pelosi goes back out there. <laughs> he did, yeah. So I didn't watch the Friends, the Friends of God one. And I know initially, it, but it's not really worth it. To initially, he, he was kind of denying it, and like Mike Jones went and took a polygraph, but he right. failed the polygraph. So they were kind of like, ah, maybe this guy was lying about the stuff. But then later right. they're like, ah, no, it's kind of really true. So he did kind of deny it or say that part of it was false at first. But later on, he seemed pretty accepting of what he did. Right. And that's so that's the part where I go. So at least this first scandal, and that's the part where this is going to get really juicy. But this first scandal, everything takes place. He goes through his restoration process. He's ousted. The church says you have to leave the state of Colorado. He right. leaves. He goes to Arizona. Kind people just take him in and let them live at his house. Yeah, that was cool. And that part, I was just like, pardon? One moment. You're going to let him near your sons after what you just heard? <laughs> You're at least not going through his U-Haul being like you have Maybe they only had daughters. Him? I don't know. <laughs> but maybe they had no kids. The only time you're like, I'm fine leaving this pastor with my teenage daughter. So like, the only time, like um, that was neat. Um, so all of that transpires. Um, the SBC, the Southern Baptist Church, says, yeah, you're no longer one of our ministers. Who comes and picks him off the waivers? Uh, the freaking free Methodists. Now, I didn't know there's a difference between the Methodists and the free Methodists. Uh, what's but... the difference? <clears throat> oh, okay. Were you expecting me to have done research? Yeah, yeah, I was. No. Um, I could care less what the difference is. So they ordain him. He ends up starting another church in Colorado Springs, I think in 2011, something like that. So it was a few years. Yeah. He started preaching here and there, doing like barns or whatever. And, um, <clears throat> you know, he was doing Oprah. I think they came out with a book. Like him and his wife wrote a book. I think it was called Why I Did It. Or No, that was that was O.J., <laughs> Um, or how I did it? <laughs> no. Or I did nine eleven. How to do it? Was, yeah, that's right. With a dude. And so all that transpires, and then for ten or plus years, Ted Haggard is a non-factor, like just right nothing. And then in the course of wanting to do this podcast, I was like, oh man, I got to look up Ted Haggard. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to somebody at church, and they go, you know, he was like an overseer of our church. I was like, what? <laughs> um. Uh, so then, um, it turns out earlier this year, Mr. Haggard, 2022, 
did it again. 2022? He did it again, bro. With um, the meth and everything or just with, with the, the guy? With the meth and everything. But this oh time, my gosh. he inappropriately touched people, boys at his church. Yeah, whom, yeah, I read about that too. Yeah, one of whom was a minor at the time when the inappropriate touching started. Now, yeah. uh, everybody's soft pedaling. They're just saying there was just inappropriate touching. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say maybe there was something more to that. <clears throat> but And then he, like his church had dwindled in size. They'd, they'd shrunk. So they sold the building that the church was in, and he's just now doing church from home. Um, home church. Story house. Yeah. Good idea so, with a dude who likes to get a little handsy. Here's all I'm saying, okay? Buddy, there's, I love you. I really do, okay? And I, it's clear to me. I shouldn't say I love you. I don't want you to get the wrong impression. I think you're a nice <laughs> man, okay? I don't know if I'm your type or not, but I'm just, I'm not interested. Nah, in nah, you're probably not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get the impression I'm a little too chocolatey for his taste. Um, he liked them light-skinned and thick. That's yeah. Muscularly thick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, hey, uh, I think that if you wanted to be some sort of influencer of some variety in this, in the world of, I, I'm a person here. My struggles in the world of podcasting. I think you would be accepted with open arms. Sure. I think you would. I think you'd find an audience. I think you'd find a pretty big audience. Yeah. I'm just saying, maybe vocational ministry in the context of running a church or being the lead pastor of a church, probably not for you. Hundred <clears throat> percent. And yeah, there's a and, lot of and, and like he he would agree with that too. Though he, he agreed with it too. He said, ah, I can't do this thing. I've sinned. You you can't you can't do this. He even said what I really like, and I know you like this too. He said the church is a business, and what I did doesn't fit the business model because yes. you can't you can't have this message and then be doing the things you say you're not supposed to be doing. And he's completely right. The church is a business, and yeah, right. And he, I'm not offended that it's a model. business. Right. I'm not even offended that it's a business because Christians exist. We buy stuff. Why shouldn't we have a business that represents our interests? And yeah. As someone who opposes taxes as a um, as theft, and I, I view them as theft, and uh, they figured out how to organize themselves and not pay any taxes. God bless. But well, one point, thing he said, one thing he said though about the the business, the church is a business. I, I think this is important. He said, I think they forgot that I'm their business. He said, the sinner, the person who's done wrong, the person who needs forgiveness and healing, is their business, and I think that's also hundred percent correct. Yes. Uh, so maybe don't exile and excommunicate him. Let him stay. Let him receive healing. <clears throat> let him sit in the pew. Um, that's maybe more more appropriate. Um, right. I think we really have to take a look at how the church, again, and the same thing with the, the Driscoll one, we have to look at how the church failed, not just the leader, the whole right. institution around him, right? With uh, Driscoll, it was everyone around him was letting him run wild and do and say and get away with the things he was doing. With Ted here... It's they were like, Matt, we're going to distance ourselves from you. We're not going to help you. You know, where was anyone? He, through, he's going through struggling to find a job. He was like hanging doors on people's, hanging little advertising hangers on people's doors for work. You know, where was anyone in the church who was a business owner? Just give, just give him a job. They yeah, that's help the guy out. You know, there were some people who let him live somewhere, but a lot of times he was staying in hotels. Yeah. You know, I, I think they failed him in that way. Uh, they failed him in uh, when uh, Pelosi asked him, because he was quoted in saying, if you think you're going to do something you shouldn't be doing, just tell someone about it. Just confess it. And she said, why didn't you tell anyone you were struggling with this? He said, I didn't feel like I could because you know, I'm a leader of 30 million people. Mm. I have no one to go to. So I think we're failing our church leaders and not offering them the support they need if they have a struggle in their lives, too. I mean, we got to look at that side of it. And it's not just support, like grace. Where is the opportunity to invite this man into the grace of Jesus Christ to go, so you like dicks, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not taking a stance on the subject matter one way or the other. I have feelings about it, of course, as everyone does. I have convictions about, the, about it. 
But my view is that if there isn't an, the, the you know, if there's, <clears throat> if there isn't room for people who are broken, in, including in ways that I find weird, if there isn't room for them at church, where are they going to, where are they supposed to go? I remember in church number two that I planted, so the one in Minnesota, not the one that we did together. Yeah. Um, one of the guys, someone had come in with their girlfriend and they were holding hands, two, two women. And he was kind of losing it. And then a moment later, he, he he was having a problem with it. And then he goes, okay. And I go, what was that? And he goes, well, God was speaking to me and said, where else are they going to go? Like, where else exactly. should they go? Um, and I'm not any... God, you could say that God put it on his heart. I could say that, but I wouldn't because I'm not an insane person. I don't know. I, so here's the other thing. I don't know if you actually believe what it is we believe. I don't. I shouldn't say we. If you believe, if I, if I actually believe what I believe about God and that when somebody opens their heart and they say, Jesus lives in my heart, right? Mm-hmm. And we believe that, that in that moment the Holy Spirit comes to live with you and is influencing your decisions. I can't, with a with a right mind, to, and this is something that drives me nuts, say to a person who loves Jesus and is doing their best to be righteous and live the gospel, I can't assume that I'm hearing, I, I know what God wants for them, because I don't know how God is speaking to them or what God's plan is for their life, to know that maybe, you know, because I, and the other thing too is when it comes to gay people and church and that sort of thing, in this life, we have to do what's called trade-offs. There's no perfect solutions. That's the great economist Thomas Sowell. There's no solution. There's only trade-offs. And sometimes we have to accept that people are going to make choices that we don't necessarily agree with in terms of a spiritual or biblical context. And we can accept that they're making choices we don't agree with. But the trade-off is they love Jesus and they're working on it, or maybe they're not going to work on it, but they love Jesus. They love Jesus, yeah. And again, just like Driscoll, how many people did Ted Haggard influence? How many people did he care for, support, bring into the kingdom of God? You know, these are things that are supposed to matter to evangelicals, but all of a sudden find out he likes to be massaged by another man, and uh, does that invalidate all of that? I don't think think we can. No, I don't think it does. And I would also add, um, I get massages from dudes because why am I paying $112 for some Vietnamese lady to rub me down or it doesn't feel like anything? I'm like, no, I want a linebacker-sized gentleman to shove his elbow into my shoulders because I have so much stress from carrying this podcast on my shoulders. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> no, but, I mean, uh, I think the you know this issue of you know gay people in church, I think it's, I, I think that... Well, also, they, you know, whose fault is it they're, they're attracted to our churches? We've talked about the feminine experience of church. I mean, you go to church, and Jesus is a guy who yeah. presumably had a penis, and yeah. I sing songs to him about how I love him and how yes. I want him to come inside of me with his Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> and you're wondering how all these gays are ending up here. Right. It's a little... We've kind of asked for it. And um, I, I have had that. So here's the, the part of my brain where I'm in a, I'll be at church and the worship is going. And I stop for a second and go, you know, if you just change the context a little bit, doesn't take anything away from it. I'm not, I'm not denying any of that being a good thing. I'm just saying if you just, but that's what the point of this whole podcast is, is like we have to be able to point at that and go, isn't that a little LGBTQIA plus and then you got somebody waving a flag. It's not a rainbow flag, but there's another person, rain, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, this thing of, like, well, where should they go? And yeah. um, I think it's a re- very relevant topic or discussion for – and, you know, I think I brought this up before on, on one of the, our other episodes. I remember a situation where someone's family was broken up because the dad – uh, came out of the closet yeah. after however many 20-something years. I mean, they have five children or something like that, many kids. And, um, 
you know, the church, from what I remember, I don't know the whole story, and it's not my business to tell it, but the church declined to help the, the now single mother because it would, it would be viewed as endorsing. It's like, you know, you're helping broken people. Yeah, come on. I mean, I mean, that's the same thing as saying, hey, listen, if we help people who are addicted to math, it's going to seem like we're pro-meth. Yeah, it's like it's ridiculous. Nobody is that pro meth except for the cartels. Okay, <laughs> anti haggard. Um, right. So the part where the part where it broke down for me was he did it again, but he kept it together for a decade. So that's good, right? Um, but this is also kind of why um, this is a delicate subject. But I'm just going to give my opinion because where else am I going to give it? This is kind of why when it comes to people who are like, no, you should just go through a process of conversion and pray to Jesus and then marry a woman. I'm like, well, let's hold your horses with the second part. And it's not in, in, and in church, we do this thing where I call, I call it, um, so the socialization of our morals, somebody's making poor decisions. So we try to attach them to somebody making better decisions to try and, you know, the, the rising tide lifts all boats yeah. kind of theory. Yeah. And this will, this will come up in our section about how the church is um, hurting men in some ways. Yeah. This uh, is how I got drugged down into this podcast. Uh, Danny was struggling with many things, many different sins. So right. a pastor came alongside me and said, you need to disciple Danny. And Danny ended up me, uh, discipling me in the ways of darkness. So that is why we are here together today. Wait, hold on. Please <laughs> tell me that actually happened. No. Okay. Because I'm more. I'm trying to think of like who was it? Was it the person with the initials J.K. who said that? Because mm -mm. he should. Yeah. <clears throat> um. No, but that's why I'm a little more pensive about. Hey, let's just get this person really prayed up, and they're going to be straight, and they're going to go marry a girl, and that's where I go. Hey. And I'm not. And here's the other thing. I don't know how to solve or deal. I shouldn't say solve. I don't know the most biblically appropriate way to deal with this situation, right? Neither does the church. The church is very bad at dealing with any kind of addict, drug, alcohol, mm -hmm. sex. They've gotten a little bit better. They've got, like, Celebrate Recovery now. Okay. You can go if it's a sort of a 12-step program where it's, that's I, more accepting of we know you're here and you struggle with these things. Right. Here's a program that's going to help. That's a Christian program, so that's a little I, better. I just, but I, I, I celebrate recovery. Yeah. yeah. Well, you go to pick up chicks, so that doesn't count. <laughs> that, but it does count. But it does count because I know my target audience, right? So it does count because I'm also broken, and you know, here's the thing. Here's what I've realized when it comes to dating girls out of celebrate recovery. <laughs> yeah. It's that um, my life seems really awesome now. <laughs> it's like. Like I, it seems like I've really got it together. I don't. Yeah. But it seems like I really got it together because I'm not hooked on anything, right? Yeah. Um. I, you know, like I have good credit, and like I don't have creditors calling my phone. So like I'm, I'm an ace now. Like I just, I I just went somewhere where my status was just. I I stayed right here. I just went and found you know a community that was where I could you know compete. Better. Sure. Yeah. I'm glad that's working out for you. I think I wouldn't say it's working out. It's working, but not out. But yeah. <laughs> so, but it is, you know, uh, but I'm just saying that the, the church, I, I hate this analogy, but it's probably an okay one. And the church has to be a hospital for sick people. But it kind of does. So, like, if Ted Haggard, so, like, if Ted Haggard has a, like, like we, you were saying, <clears throat> representing 30 million Americans, and he happens to, you know, he's on the DL and he likes dicks and math. <clears throat> like, if there's no if there's no one for him to call, and I'll say this much. Yeah. You, you're one of the... The church, the, the church is supposed to be a place you can go um, with your sin. Yeah. So I will say when I've had issues, you're one of two people I can openly discuss things with without thinking like, your wife is going to find out or um, you're going to have weird feelings or whatever about it, or you're going to treat me differently now because you know this. 
there's three men in my life like that. That's it. Three. Yeah. I have a pretty large, thankfully and gratefully, I have a pretty large community of Christian people around me. And I, for one reason or another, one thing that I understand is I cannot be open with some of these people, good things or bad things, because the way they're going to treat me afterwards, and I don't sure. is is going to be bad. And the, the other thing that pisses me off in church community, which is I, I said this earlier and ADD this away, was I wouldn't call myself a mature Christian, but I'm somebody who's always trying to grow in faith. I don't. I mean, that's a weird phrase. Um, because there's the it, the presumption is is like okay, you're like a battery, and that one day you're going to get to 100. percent And my view mm-hmm. is you're, it's not. That's not the case. Right. Um, but I've been in the game long enough, right? I've been yeah. doing this long enough. And to have people who are my age or sometimes younger just talk to me like I just joined the team. No, I'm deep in it. I'm yeah. in the game. And um, that lack of, like, just because we might have a different view. Now, of those three, I would actually say four men that I can call up. And, dude, anytime I say, well, you know, I'm, I'm having this experience or this problem, we can have a nuanced dialogue about it in depth, and there's no judgment. And I, I don't care if people are judging me. It's just if you're not going to be sensitive with my situa- with my information, I'm a privacy whack nut, you know. Mm-hmm. I actually make you use Signal to text me. Because, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, if I feel like you're just going to skip over the nuanced parts of a problem or struggle that I'm having in my life. And it's just going to become like this weird talking point for somebody else. But that's what church has become. And we yeah. kind of, you know, it kind of, that part kind of grosses me out. Yeah. 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 I completely agree. I think, um, there, the church should be a place where you could find people where you could talk to about some of the most, sensitive issues and still feel like you're wanted there at mm. the end of the day. That is uh, so but, true. But you, but you can't, you, you can't. And, I, and I'll tell you why I've been, I've noticed this theme. There are two churches I've gone between in, in the new city. Uh, I'm in Tampa now in, in Tampa, okay. two churches. And uh, they both have said the same thing more or less that what their, what their goal is when you go to church, their goal is behavior modification. And how did they? And how, how did they disseminate that view? Like, what was uh, their specific wording? So one was straight up in their sermon notes. Don't get me started on fill in the blank sermon notes, because uh, God forbid your congregation learn to think for themselves and read scripture for themselves. But uh, fill in the blank sermon notes, and it said something to the effect of, "You have to feel like you uh, people have to feel like they belong before they're going to behave the way that they should." I mean, it's a straight up. Uh, uh, you know, admission that that's what they want is behavior modification. Uh, I was heard another sermon at a different church. It more or less said the same thing, you know, is that, uh, you know, they, well, they use the word sanctification, right? They say, oh, yeah. you know, you get here, you get saved, but you're not sanctified yet. Yeah, what so is that sanctification? Was the word, yeah, so sanctification that was the word was... is just like being made perfect in God, being made holy, but really and from a practical standpoint, it's just behaving the way that the church wants you to behave. But they, this, I, it's nice that they're admitting that that's what it's all about to them. Yeah. Getting your tithe money and getting you to behave the way they want you to. But that's that's why, like, people don't feel like they can go to the church with these types of problems because it doesn't fit the behavior model that you're supposed to fit. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why I've always been, in many ways, uh, not somebody who was an outsider to my own community. Um and there's part of me goes, why go where you're not wanted? Go where you're celebrated. But the other part of me goes, you're not going to treat me like that. I'm going to force you to love me. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's only one pastor in my life who I had a close relationship with. He's out in Florida now, actually. I think he's in Jacksonville. And he was the funniest. Like, I would bring friends there, and he'd be like, so has he ever sold you drugs? Because I think he sold me drugs once. And I was like, this is my guy. <laughs> This is my guy. He's a, um, but <clears throat> yeah, I think that's a, you know, a valid criticism of church is that it's not a place where you can be open. But when they say things like behavior modification, 
and this is going to sound they don't say it they don't say it outright it's 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 couched in something sanctification is usually how they present it but i was shocked at the sermon notes that said people you know they have to feel like they belong before they're going to behave the way they should behave that was just straight up like wow this this is a cult i understand why outsiders call churches cults yeah completely completely understand and i think I'll, I'll add this on here. I don't, you may or may not not agree, but I think with the behavior modification, if that's the point of your church or that's the point of your preaching, and you think that once people get saved, they need to be sanctified and start behaving a certain way, I think you're reading the Bible wrong. I think you're reading the Bible as a sort of a like a, a psychologist handbook for how someone who's properly socialized should behave, and that's that's not what it is. That's not what I, it is. I think you're treating the New Testament the way the Old Testament is treated as a book of laws and rules. Mm -hmm. Now, the New Testament, Paul says, everything is lawful, but not everything is expedient. Right. Not everything is good for you. Right. So I, when it, when in the context of sin, that tends to be where I go. And now I start sounding like Rob Bell in our first episode. I said, I'm going to end up sounding like Rob. I don't, <laughs> believe, I don't believe anything he believes. I, I don't think anyway. But this is where I start going, this is a nuanced issue. And for some people, it can be the case that it is not a problem for you to do a little math from time to time. And you just do a little math and you kick back and it's fine. And you go on with your day, you do a little math on... on, on People don't five. kick back, I don't think, when they do, they do meth. They don't chill on the couch and fall asleep. <laughs> you, you do a little meth, you clean, you vacuum your house 50 times, yeah, that's you squeegee more like your windows, you go down to Starbucks, you squeegee their windows. <laughs> um, I remember I used to see a gal, and we would drive past this house all the time. What do you mean up. by see a gal? Can you uh, give more details? No. <laughs> I'd pick her up from her parents' house and we would drive past this house and they had a rusty Chevy Cavalier and they were always vacuuming it. And I was like, you know, buddy, it's clean. <laughs> There's only so much clean you can make it. And then she goes, oh, no, that guy's addicted to math. And I go, uh... oh, this is actually hysterically around the same time Ted Haggard was doing math. <laughs> so, I don't know. I, I presume they had different different suppliers based on the distance probably so but um this this need for unfortunately corporate corporate church to here's what it is did our custom did did the the people who walk through the door buy our product the only way to know that and my view my bar is really low if somebody says i love jesus i follow jesus he's the savior of my life the whole gospel thing done you're on the team but mm-hmm. the problem is the church is looking for further, like, hey, right. we spent $10 million building a building, and what happens is churches end up asking people to conform to the image of the church and right. not the image of Christ. And the, why this ends up sounding wishy-washy and Rob Bell is because I go, for some people, they're going to have a couple of cocktails on a Friday night. It's going to be fine. And for somebody else, he's going to have one cocktail. It's going to lead to 10 cocktails that he's doing blow. And, <laughs> you know, describes my weekend. Kidding. Mm-hmm. So everything is allowable. It's all relative. But, that's but the, it's that's not the, all beneficial for the individual doing it, to go back to that scripture. And so what ends up happening is, for me, th- that makes me believe even harder. So I go, like, I keep, you know, I, I always say that I'm, you know, my faith is 99.999, it adds a 9. When I go, okay, it's an individual situation. Because if it's all a blanket statement, if it's all blanket and we all have to kind of behave the same, I go, why would you make everybody so different? No. Well, and we, the thing is, we, we again, we fail to look at how the Bible is written. It's not all blanket. It's clearly not because the New right. Testament is mostly a, a compilation of letters written from certain specific people to other specific people to address specific issues. And we look at it and say, oh, that's written to me. Right. Face value, that, that's, that's for me. Right. And that lack of nuanced application of the scripture to your life. Right. And, that, and here's the thing. That's where deconstruction is born, right? Right. Hypocrisy 
and we read one thing in the Bible, and then we see Christians apply it in a way that makes app like I always say Calvinism is like there's like the there's like a there's a there's some churned butter there, but somehow you turn it into a salmon. Like you put it on like I get it, the butter goes on the salmon, but where'd you get the fish from, bro? Like it's mm-hmm. the elements of what you're talking about, the spices are all there, right? So mm-hmm. I'm not disagreeing with that. But then you pull out the whole no, it's a cheeseburger. That's like the spices are all there, but where'd you get the thing? Mm-hmm. And I see that through line, and I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> but I understand where the churches are coming from going. It's too difficult for us to deal with. We have one guy struggling with this. We have a gal coming to our church, wants to to be a part, but hey, her entire income relies her relies on her showing her feet on the internet. How do we like? She can't go to Subway and make sixty grand a month. I think so, uh, the, doesn't the gospel say something about like uh, how beautiful the feet of those who bring the uh, the word of the Lord? Something to that <laughs> to that degree. All the spices. She are may there, not be but far I, off. I, all the spices are there, but I don't know how you got to that conclusion. But I I, I see for so many people and. That 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 it, that becomes very difficult, and it's just so. It, and part of it too is it's just icky to deal with. I don't want to deal with it. It's it's yeah, it, yeah, and it's not um like church churches can't do that. I don't I, churches can't really admit that scripture is nuanced, and then it takes some work to understand them, and that there's some relativity. You can't do that because you you and is the institution of the church or the leader. You're in a position of power. So to start saying, to start admitting, like, I don't really know what this means, or it could mean this, it could mean that, uh, you're going to lose your authority. I, I had a an Old Testament professor who I really respected because he wouldn't take stances on Scripture. He would write up the different interpretations of a passage of Scripture on the board, and then someone in the class would always push him and say, well, which one is right? And he would always answer the same way. He'd say, well, on Mondays... Wednesdays and Fridays, I think this one's right. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's this one's. And on the weekends, I believe in this one. He would never tell you. He wouldn't guide you one way or the other. I really respected that. But church leaders and churches can't do that. They can't admit they don't know something. There are, there, there are multiple interpretations because they lose their authority. And who's going who's gonna to keep coming on Sundays and giving you their money if you're not there to tell them what's right, what's true, and right. guide? And that- and that, and that, in the crux of it, is how um, uh, churches want people who are deep in the. And here's the other deep in the faith. And here's another. This is an addendum here, I guess. <clears throat> We're deep have, into an addendum at this point, I think. Well, That's I don't okay. think it's some pretty thin material we started with, but um, this is why your mission. You don't have to hop on a plane and go to some foreign country to do missions work, there's a mission field in your home. There's a mission field in your backyard. There are people who don't know Jesus. There are people who went to church and were raised Christian who believe Jesus hates them because their back hurts and they use they use cannabis to treat their back pain. Yeah. And and you know or what have you or they like or they have a subscription to HBO and they saw a nipple and they're like listen, I can't have like one of our friends um, I don't want to say his name, but we watch UFC fights with him. We used to anyway. He's the most authentic Christian. One of the most, like he was, he was, he was raised in church, and then he left. He came back, and then didn't fake anything. It was just like, nah, I still do this. X, like he just wasn't fake about any of it. Yeah. And I appreciate about that. I, I appreciated that about him. So. Oh, before we get going, we do have to yeah. tell you about one of our sponsors. We have a new sponsor, right? That's right. It's called the <clears throat> It's called ROM13. It's a new app. You can download it. ROM13. Right. So what this app what this app will help you do, download go to it's rom13.io/church. You can mm-hmm. go download it today. What it helps you do is incorporate more patriotism into your faith. Because you as an American don't do enough worshiping of the flag. The flag, of course, is a symbol of our country, and our right. country is allegorically Israel in the Bible. So we are God's chosen people in his chosen land. 
So if you aren't doing enough worshiping of the government, of, you know, it's not enough just to... As it says in Romans 13, if you don't take any work trying to understand it, you yeah. should submit to the authorities. So And it's not enough so just this to submit. app, ROM 13, it has right. daily devotionals to help Correct. you submit. Right, and it starts out very easy. You just say the Pledge mm -hmm. of Allegiance, and then you start getting into how to pray to the founders, the founding fathers of this country, much like how the Catholics pray to saints and Mary and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you start out with that, and then, you know, you move on to praying to Abraham Lincoln and George Washington. And um, the original version of the app had Harriet Tubman in there, but they she's out. Oh, so, rough. Yeah. Frederick Douglass out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you. Can what did to, Elon Musk take over or something? What happened there? Ah, uh, you know, uh, not quite. Um, so if you guys want, you can go to rom13.io/church. You uh, you get fifteen percent off your first year subscription, and um, that's a deal. You, that's right. And if you use our promo code church, you they will also send you. Um, it's a it's a T-shirt with it with a cross. But the inside of the cross is emblazoned with the American flag. Oh, I That's, love that. Yeah. yeah. I, love, I that. love that for us, man. I love that for us. God's really just put it on my heart to go 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 download ROM 13 right now. That's right. And with that, I would like to let you know, Brett, you are canceled. You're canceled, Danny. Thank you. <laughs>